Amen. Just give a, a round of applause, if you don't mind, an expression of appreciation to the Lord today. Amen. He's a God that loves us. He's a God that cares about us today. Amen. Just remain standing with me, if you will, all across this room and get your Bible. We're going to read a number of passages today so that we don't have to read them at each point this morning when I begin to share. Hannah, Chase, Miles, Caitlin, Eden, and Carl, we do celebrate you. We are proud for you, but we're in a, another celebration this morning that we're going to do. Now, where I come from, it's about 1242, so we've already missed that time. I don't know what it is for you here or how you deal with that, Pastor Kevin, but I'm going to be a little bit this morning in my time to honor the Lord with what I believe he's speaking to this church. I do pray for your pastor. I don't know you, not, only a few of you I have ever met, but I do call this church out in prayer, and I am asking God to move on behalf of this congregation because I believe that strong churches are needed in this world of chaos to bring about the restoration that God is wanting to bring. Amen? You agree with me in that? Strong families make up strong churches. Strong, strong churches impact communities. Amen? Amen. We're going to read several passages of Scripture. You're going to see those on the screen. As a matter of fact, just for simplicity, I won't turn to all of those in my Bible. I'll read them from the screen as they come up today for you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 50. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Even though David had no sword, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Exodus chapter 13, verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear a solemn oath, saying, God will certainly come to your aid. Then you must take my bones with you from this place. Next scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10. When Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house. The windows in its upper room opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees. He prayed. He gave thanks to his God. Incidentally, which is the same Jehovah that I'm serving this morning, just as he had done before. That's very important. Just as Daniel had done before. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's ground this word together in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. We'll go to one more passage in the New Testament today. Galatians chapter 5, verse 7. You were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? Holy Lord. Will you move in this place today? You know us. You know our lives. You know our chaos. You know our victories. You know our failures. You know our celebrations. And you know we need you. So today, Lord, open heaven and move on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. You know what? I need you to stand one more time. Just one more time, please. Everybody, if you're physically able to stand, stand up. I want you to turn around completely, all the way back around and face me. Thank you very much. All the way around. If you're not spinning, you need to spin. Wood weight on you. Now face me. Turn all the way around and face me again. And you may be seated now. There is absolutely no spiritual significance. Well, maybe there is to me asking you to stand the second time and spin around, other than this. I wanted to know if you have the ability to respond. And it looked like to me, all of you in this room have the ability to respond. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to ask you if you will make that same willingness of obedience to respond to Jehovah who is wooing us and calling us into a great place in his presence. Amen? Now this morning, this is going to sound like probably a, perhaps a catalog of William's life. It's not intended to be that other than for me just to show you kind of a stream feel of what's been happening in my life, what's been going on in my world for a good term of time over the last 53 years. I'm going to do this 
unpacking that 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 passage that you saw just a few minutes ago. And if you'll bring that passage back up for a few minutes, we're just going to unpack that together and look at it. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now, if you know the history of Paul's life and you understand that what Paul is doing in this particular passage is he's kind of cataloging as he gets towards the end of his journey to be reminded to say there were different metaphors that I will use to illustrate different areas of my life. Metaphorically, he tosses the first one out and he says, I fought a good fight. Now, I'm an old Marine Corps vet. Now, I, I used to like a scrap every once in a while. Now, it probably wasn't the right place to say that, Kevin. You know, that we used to like to fight because it wasn't really a Christian fight that we were doing back in the day. It was just a human reality of we were just born to fight. So as a Marine Corps vet, I used to like to scrap every once in a while. And if there was nobody that we wanted to scrap against, we'd scrap among ourselves just because it, it fueled our fire, perhaps. That's not the fight I want to talk about today because if you're actually fighting among yourself, it's a pretty good time to say there's enough of chaos in the world that the name of Christianity should not bring any chaos. Instead, we should be bringing deliverance and power and presence of God to bring liberty in a place of chaos. So I'm going to use Paul's metaphor of a good fight and let's talk about this guy, David, for just a couple of minutes. Now, you know the passages of David. Probably you know the story of David. You know his life. David was a young boy. He was a worshiper by nature, a writer of songs. He was a keeper of the, of the animals. He was one who honored his father. He was one who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he was one who gained favor from God. So much to so to say that even though he had favor from God, he was typically belittled by those around him in the midst of the favor he had from God. Understand that key point this morning. There's going to be moments in your life when the enemy is going to come in the way of people that they say they may like you or they may be for you, but in fact they may be against you, and it might not really be them, but it's the enemy working through them. Hang tight. Kevin, I just feel the Spirit of the Lord this morning. I want to ask you folks, I don't have any idea what you got to do the rest of the day, but I don't want you to miss this moment. Please hang around for a little bit. This altar call in a few minutes. I believe God's going to touch you. I believe God's going to open heaven. And I think every one of you that stood a moment ago and you spun around in a circle and you sat back down, I believe if you'll be obedient to God today and you'll respond to Him, God's going to feel you. God's going to touch you. God's going to empower you. God's going to catapult you into a place that He needs you to be. My life has been a fight since my early age. I was born as a very sick child. I had three blood transfusions as a little boy, complete blood taken out in the early 60s, new blood put in. I actually died when I was six years old. I was pale. I was laying on the bed. I was going to death. But for whatever reason, God brought me back to life. My mom accounts it, and she would say that she felt a wind blow in one side of the, the, the parsonage at Ogeechee Road in Savannah, Georgia. And as the wind blew in, she said, I took a gasp of air. And I'd been dead for a number of minutes. I was cold to the touch. I was purple. I was deceased. But God chose that he wanted William to live for some reason I do not know yet in its entirety, but I know that God has still got you living today for a reason for his kingdom work and his cause. Amen. You say, really, Kevin, you brought this guy up here to yell at us on a graduation day? Yeah, because the funny thing is I failed high school. 19 F's on my permanent record. 19, that's clearly almost close to 20. I know a little bit of math from the second grade. That's right. 19 F's. Incidentally, I have a Ph.D. That's not the thing to brag about other than to say this. It doesn't really matter what you're starting or how difficult it was. It matters whether or not you're going to continue and whether or not you're going to finish the work that God is doing in your life. Amen? David was a young man who made a decision. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And he did for the most part of his life. 
David was a young man who found an intimacy with God. Please hear me this morning. God is wanting to bring you into a place of intimacy with him. If you've never had the joy of waking up in the morning and somebody praying in your bedroom and it's you and you didn't even know it because you don't have an idea of how long God's been praying through you, then you need to stop everywhere you can and say, God, give me an intimacy with you where you'll speak to me, where you'll speak through me, God. Hallelujah. David was this man. David had that fight going on. David placed the, took himself to a place of battle. He was obedient to his father, taking food to the place of battle where the armies of God were being fought against by the enemy of God. You know the battlefield. You know the story. I won't belabor the point. But the reality is this. It's very simple. As David stood before Goliath that day, Obviously not equipped, well equipped enough to take on the battle of his enemy. But on the ex external he lacked, but on the internal he was full. Now hear me. On the external it appeared he lacked, but on the internal he was equipped. If you haven't yet focused in on that this morning, you need to focus in on the internal condition of your life and let God Fill you with his glory and with his presence so that he can come in out of you what needs to come out of you on the day of reckoning in this, in this situation. Very simple. He defeated Goliath. Goliath falls face down. David goes, gets the sword, cuts his head off, takes it into the city. The prophecy is true. He will kill ten thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands upon ten thousands. Can I tell you something this morning? I don't know who you are, Chase. My heart is kind of toward you a little bit today. I'm a chaplain with the fire department, the sheriff's department. I'm a volunteer firefighter. I appreciate your service to the police department the days ahead. But I'm going to tell you something, guys. There's a place that God positions you for his kingdom calls where you don't even know where it's at until you get in the middle of it. And if you are not equipping yourself when you get there, you're going to miss that moment that God's wanting to give you. If you're really life church Huntsville and that's who you say you are, let me tell you something. When you walk out of this room today, walk out in a new life, in a new power, in a new fulfillment, in a new strut with the power of God, radiant and evident and visible in your life. David killed Goliath, delivered, this is important to hear, an entire nation. David had his woes, David had his failures, David had the cost of his failure, but at the end of his life, at the end of his journey, David accomplished and did what God had called him to do. Question number one, are you willing to accomplish what God has called you to do? Then begin now. Start now. Number two, he says, I have finished the race. I'm a marathon runner. Put that picture up for me, if you will. I brought them with me to prove it to you. I've got medals. You got that picture? Does it go make it or not? It may. There it is. I got medals. I took a picture of it right there on the floor. These boys are good. These tech boys are good. And girls, they're good, man. I took that picture laying, sitting right there on the floor, right there where your carpet's at. Because I realize you might not even be able to see these. You might think they're fake. They're not real. I'll let you hold them later if you want to. You hear the bling? Now, the race and the metaphor that Paul is laying out is not necessarily a marathon in the old Greek games day. It's more of a relay. So the message to you is very simple. This is not a race that you run by yourself. This is a race that you run with somebody else. But if nobody else is willing to run you, you better keep running. Some of you don't have a family to cheer you on. Hebrews is a family. It's a hallelujah. It is a whole group of people who have gone before you and sitting around you are people who will cheer you on to say you can overcome, you can win, you can overcome this battle, you can defeat this charge. You will be a victor in Jesus' name. Marathon is not necessarily easy. It's a very difficult thing. I'm going to show you a picture in just a few minutes. Not yet, but you're going to see a picture of my family. I'm a, I'm a serious marathon runner. I run marathons to raise money. This year I had a one, mar one marathon, 26.2 miles on my, on, my, on my schedule. I had three half marathons on my schedule. I'll show you a picture in a few minutes. I'll talk about it in the next section. 
but my son had an injury in a rodeo four weeks ago yesterday. I had to clear my schedule. I had to stay home. My wife and I had to shift our work to where we could be home half a day to take care of our 23-year-old son. That story is going to come in a few minutes. But the point I'm telling you is this. God is a God who sees it before you see it. He's a God who knows it before you have to endure it. He is a God who will equip you to make it through it if you're willing and obedient and will respond to the power of God's call upon your life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, give him a hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You say, William, why do you run? I run to raise money. This old body doesn't like to run. I get a little thrill from it every once in a while. But you know what? 26.2 is a very long way. You know why I brought these particular medals? I got a bunch more in between these bookends. But I brought this one because it was my first half marathon. It was brutal. Nashville, Tennessee. Too many hills in Nashville to be running. I don't even like to drive them to start with. But I ran that race because I felt compelled to do something of significant value to make a difference for somebody else. And so I started running. This last one that you got up here, and again, these are the bookends. This is the one I got last October. I'll replace this one with another one this year. It's the Marine Corps Marathon in Washington, D.C. I'll run that on October 21. But the point is this. It's not about all the medals in the journey. It's about today. If you have not already started, you need to start. And if your start has been three steps forward and 50 steps backward, then take three steps forward and start again, praise God. And let the power of God, in, hallelujah, fill you with his presence to the place where you can run for him. Okay, William, what are you talking about? Let's talk about Joseph for just a minute. Joseph, you know Joseph's story, son of Jacob. Brothers didn't like him. Sold him into slavery. Did I tell you a while ago that somebody's going to come against you when you're going for God? If you ain't used to that right now, you better get used to it because it's going to keep on happening. As long as you got flesh and blood, as long as you're alive, as long as you're breathing, somebody's going to dislike you just because they want to and it don't even make any sense. But the reality is it doesn't really matter because it's not about you anyway. It's about him who is in you, working through you so that a generation might be saved. Amen? Joseph put him into slavery, into Egypt. His life is in such an array as he's held into bondage, but because he had God's favor before he got to bondage, God gave him continued favor, which put him in a place of responsibility and a place of authority and a place of favor. Now watch this. It's real interesting to me. Good stuff. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Because Joseph had made the Israelites swear a solemn oath saying, God will certainly come to your aid. Then you must take my bones with you from this place. Some of you, grab a hold of this. Don't miss this moment. 300 years, history will tell us, between Joseph and Moses. But a decree in the hands of God is a lifetime. And a promise with the heart of God is for eternity. Whether you break it or whether you stumble it or whether you mess it up, it doesn't it does matter. But it doesn't end the promise because a promise from God will be fulfilled. And what God's wanting today is for you and I to fulfill our promises that we make to him. You want to talk about finishing the race? You want to talk about fellow high school? Yeah. You know, talk about failing out of Lee University, or quitting is the better term. I, I, I'm a special education client, so I went to school to get a special education degree. I have a master's that I was nearly finishing that nobody really knows about because I quit. Yeah, I have a master's in teaching in special education and emphasis, and I was one semester away in the early or the late 1990s, one semester away from finishing. But you know why I didn't finish? Because I failed the PPST, which is the precursor, and curse is probably a good term in there, applicable, not good, I suppose, to the national teacher's exam. And if you fail a PPST, it's a pretty good indication you're not going to pass the NTE. So what did I do? I kept driving a school bus. I quit. I didn't go back to school. I didn't finish. Jim Bilbo, Cliff Schimmels, all those guys tried to get hold of me. It didn't matter. I just went on back to life and did what I needed to do. Now, let me help you understand something. College is not for everybody, and I work at a college. My, 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 my house payment is paid because of your tuition. Thank you very much. 
But college isn't for everybody, so understand that. That's okay. But endurance is for everybody. Hallelujah. No matter what your position is, no matter what your call is, no matter what your job is, no matter what your goal is, endurance is, hallelujah, important and relevant for every one of us. Yeah, fell out of college or quit. Went back, got a job at Lee University in 2003. It's kind of an amazing thing. Had a bachelor's degree when I landed there. Finished a master's when I was there in youth and family ministry. Went on, finished a PhD. You know what a PhD is? It's pain. Seven long years. Took me eight years because a tornado in 2011 hit my house. Two weeks before I was to go back and do my comp exams. And it just about destroyed my family, just about destroyed our future, just about destroyed everything we had. But let me tell you something. God had a reason. God allowed it. God had a promise. And God is in the business of fulfilling the promise. And I'm here to tell you today, just like Joseph, if everybody has rejected you and cast you aside and you don't think you can do it, God says you can. Trust me. Walk with me. Run with me. Believe with me. Do what I tell you to do. Why? Because you know what he did? This passage isn't going to come on the screen, but I'm going to read it for you. Exodus chapter 13, verse 9. This is very important to catch this. Actually, that one did come up on the screen. Let me go to a different one here. Find it here. Genesis chapter 45, verse 7 and 8. This is important to read. Right at the end of his life, this is what he said. He says, I wanted to bring his brothers to him. Those brothers who had actually sold him into slavery, the ones who had kind of rejected him and cast him aside and lied to their dad about it all. Watch this. He brought them back to him, and he said, God sent me ahead of you. Hold on. Stop right there. God's in the business of sending some of you ahead of somebody else, and you don't even know who's going to trail, but you better put your feet sure so that those people behind you will find a place to put their feet sure in the journey ahead. And some of you elderly folks in this room who haven't really played a good journey, and you know that, and you've missed some steps along the way, it's okay. Start today. Put your feet firm in the, hallelujah, in the impression that the Holy Spirit puts for you, and take your family with you. And he said to them very clear, here it is. Come here, boys. God sent me ahead of you to establish a remnant within the land to keep you alive by the great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God who sent me here. Some of you are in a place of chaos, and you didn't put yourself there. If God puts you there, let me help you understand something. God will get you through there for somebody else's good, for his kingdom cause, to accomplish what he wants to accomplish, because God is still in control. Almost fell out of a Ph.D., and I would have had to quit my job, Kevin. How do you work at Lee and teach people if you're going to fail a Ph.D.? Well, I didn't fail, praise God, and I finished. I'll get another chance down the road to almost fail, but I pray I won't. Some of you just need to hear that word right there. Some of you are so afraid of failing, you won't step. You better start running and let God deal with the failure business because if you don't go forward, you already failed. Life Church. You're in a whole transition, and I don't know a whole lot about it except for about a year year or so ago. I was over here in, in this town in Huntsville, and I was speaking at Oakwood Bible College or whatever that is, Oakwood University, Seventh-day Adventist Church or something. I don't know. I was over here speaking one day, talking to them about college stuff. I drove by y'all's church. Kevin wasn't there. Amy wasn't there, so they were doing, they were in, I don't know, they were in meetings or something. I came by your church on a Wednesday night. I didn't even stay. I just left, and on that day, the Lord impressed my heart to pray for you. And I didn't start texting you until just a few months ago, but I've been doing that a lot earlier than that, Kevin, because I believe that Life Church, whoever you are, and all of those that are going to join you in the midst of your transition, you better get used to this place of not figuring it out, but following it. You better get used to this place that you don't understand it, but you're obedient. You better get used to the place that you don't know how it's going to happen, but you're going to believe it. Hallelujah. Because God is greater than your imagination, than your desire, than your difficulties, than your failures, because God's promise will come to pass. Amen. I got to speed up. I'm sorry. I'm taking too long this morning. But I want you to understand something. Joseph was placed in a very difficult place to, hallelujah, make a place of escape for even those that had abused him and sold him away. You better get used to the fact that your life ain't about you. And Jesus didn't save you to suck a little sin out of your life and make you feel better about yourself. He is not a vacuum cleaner. He is a Jehovah. He is a redeemer. He is a restorer. He is a liberator. And bless God, he's in this room today to empower you with his presence.
Number three, and I'll go fast forward right here. I love this next section. I kept the faith. I kept the faith. You see, I have had a good fight or two in my life with the, with the enemy, and I'll have some more. And I'm running a race, and I pray I'll finish. Put that last, put that picture up for me. This is my family. They couldn't be here today. This is unfiltered. They'd shoot me if they knew I put this picture up here. This is in the raw, Jack. Did you see me, the guy with the glasses in the back with the half eagle coming across his shirt? You know why I wear that shirt? Because it was cheap. Ain't no other reason. It's just cheap and it feels good. This was Mother's Day celebration at Tyler and Megan. On the left of the screen is Tyler, the one who looks most like me with the glasses. That's his wife, Megan. Tyler went to school. Lee University, she went to school. Lee University, she's a teacher. He works at Lee and IT. School worked for him. The one on the far side over in the hat over here, the, the, not the Calfee's hat, but the other one back there, that's Nicholas. He's my middle son. He went to school for a couple of years, played bass for singers. He hated school. He, 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 didn't, he, didn't, he said he didn't quit. He just left. He's somewhere still on the books. I don't know. I know I'm going over time. Please hang with me because God's fixing to open heaven. And some of you, your life is fixing to change. And if you miss this moment, you're going to be sad. Hear me. God's fixing to pour, hallelujah, fresh oil into this church. He's going to pour fresh oil into you. If you'll stay, if you'll be patient this morning, God's going to fill you today. My son, he's a firefighter. He's a firefighter. That's what he does for a living. He goes into fires when they're burning. I just finished up my 64-hour firefighter class. I did a live burn last week, which means I know what it means to be in a fire when it's about 500 degrees. It ain't no fun. I'm capable and legally qualified to go fight fire. I'm not as good as him. I'm not going to go in. I'm going to pray for him as they go. I'll go if I have to. But here's the deal. He chose a noble profession. So when we celebrate you today, graduates, you follow the trail that God has set for you. Don't let anybody tell you to go anywhere you don't need to go. Now, you need to listen to counsel. You need to be obedient. You need to get somebody wise to speak into your life. But you need to follow where God's footprints are and where they're laid out for you. And sometimes you won't even see them clear. But if you step, hallelujah, something will wrap around you. And it's called all of heaven. It's called all of the power of God. And the next step will be a little bit more sure. And the next step will be a little bit more sure. I'm never going to be confident that I'm doing it all right, but I'm going to be trusting that, God, you will help me find the impression that you have laid for me. Life Church, you better start looking for the impression because everywhere you step, God wants to bankrupt hell and populate heaven, and he wants to use you to do it, and you've got to be willing to go. This is my beautiful bride, 29 years. 29 years this year. She's never locked me out of the house, never sent me to the couch. There's been plenty of times she didn't wake me up, but it's okay. And we're going to make it. You know why we're going to make it? Because we made a commitment. I don't know your story. I don't know anything about your life. But here's what I do know. If you're in the will of God today at whatever your chaos is, then go forward. If you're not in the will of God today, then repent and ask God to help you go forward. I'm not here to write your story. I'm here to tell you that the author of your story and the water, the writer of your script has his pen ready and he's already wrapping it, hallelujah, around so that you might win, so that somebody else might be encouraged, so that the kingdom of God might be accomplished right here on earth, in this town, and everywhere you touch. See the boy with Calfee's hat on and the turtle shell? Maybe some of y'all been praying for him. Four weeks ago on a Saturday night, he was in Franklin, North Carolina. He was riding a horse. A horse that put him in the finals last year. He's a rodeo guy. He doesn't ride the wild stock horses. He don't ride a bull. He's not dumb. If you're a bull rider, I ain't saying you're dumb. I'm just saying you're close. And uh, he was riding this horse. Roping is a very interesting sport. This little cow runs out. You got to rope it. You got to tie it down. And if you did it with about six or seven seconds, you make money. He's nine or 11 seconds. He ain't making no money, but it's fun. Last Saturday night, or four weeks ago on a Saturday night, he's standing in the saddle roping, and his horse stops abruptly. This is a horse that took him to the finals last year. This isn't a rookie horse. This is a very accomplished horse in the rodeo business. But for whatever reason, the horse stopped dead still. When he did, Benjamin went over his head, and he penciled the ground, and he landed on top of his head. He landed on the ball of his head right here, 
It's very simple. I don't understand it. I'm just thankful that it happened this way. He tucked his chin into his chest. He told me, he said, Dad, when I was in the middle of the air, now this is not a five-minute flight plan. This is a millisecond failure. Boom, he's on the ground. He said, I tucked my chin to my head and went to my chest. And when I did, I landed on the back of my head. He gets up. He walks about 50 yards, gets his horse, walks back to the gate, sees his trailer. I'll get to the trailer. I'll sleep it off. He's a tough boy. I'm not that tough. I'd have been laying down and letting somebody come get me. He gets to the track, gets to the, gets to the gate, leans against the gate. His breathing's going away. His buddy comes, gets the horse, puts him in the ambulance. We get a phone call. I didn't get to go to this rodeo. I was working at Lee that weekend. I couldn't go. We're two hours away. It's storming. My wife and I make it in two hours. We get to Franklin, North Carolina. They tell us he's got a T3, T4, T5 break. One of them is compressed 50%. The doctor says he's got to go to surgery, so we're going to take him straight to Asheville, North Carolina. So we follow the ambulance to Asheville. Four weeks ago on this Sunday, the d- today, four weeks ago, I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. Two doctors said, wait on the neurosurgeon. We're going ahead and take you to the neurology floor because you're going to have to go to surgery. The neurologist walks in. He looks at it all. And he says, I think we're going to wait. He says, young man, let me tell you something. I don't really know why it happened this way, but it did. He said, you're alive and you should be dead. He said, you're walking and you're talking and your grip is good and you should be paralyzed. I I thought I had another Christopher Reeve story whenever they called me and told me to come to the hospital. He said, but there's something about you. And he said, so we're going to wait on surgery. Tomorrow we'll go to a neurology appointment. We'll get an update. I don't know what's going to tell us, but this I do know. Doesn't really matter what it's going to tell us. We're going to fight. We're going to run the race. We're going to finish well. We're going to do what God said for us to do because we believe that there's one greater that lives inside of us than one who opposes us. And we believe that God is stronger. Hallelujah. My son Tyler, born with Highland Membrane Disease, laid in the hospital when he was a child. He, He was very sick. Him and Megan are waiting for children, but they can't have children. They're trusting God. God's not made it happen yet. It's a very difficult journey. Nicholas, the one that's the firefighter, was born with epileptic seizures. My wife's the only saint in the bunch, man. She ain't got no problems but us. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. Some of you are running, and you're running in the wrong direction, and you need to turn around, and you need to run to Jesus today. Some of you are afraid to run because you're afraid of what people are going to think about it. You better quit that foolishness because let me tell you something. One day it's going to be laid out in the raw and everybody's going to see it. And if you're not willing to run for God, something's going to be exposed and it's going to be seen. And then you're going to be really sad about it. You better start running for God and let God make up the difference. Let me tell you what happens when a tornado hits your house. It takes all your stuff and lays it out for everybody else to see. I'm still finding stuff that left my house in 2011. We got a little, a little jar at our house with game pieces. Because about every time we mow the grass or something, we find a game piece. A game piece. We, 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 Monopoly, life, all them kind of games. Old people, you know. We find little Othello pieces. Y'all don't even know what Othello is unless you're like from the 1920s. We find this stuff laying around. You know why? They're just simple reminders. God ain't finished with us, and God ain't finished with you. Stand to your feet, please. This is a very important time. If you leave right now, you're going to miss it. You say, William, God can't touch me at home. Oh, yeah, he can. He really can. But you might miss this moment of community that I think we're fixing to experience in this church. You think God can't touch me when I get home tonight and get on my knees and ask God to touch me? Yeah, he can. But I want God to touch you right now so that on your way home, if he wants you to take a different road so you can fulfill his promise, you'll be willing to. Or if he wants you to take you to a different restaurant so you sit down at a place later than you normally would go because somebody's going to need to be able to be empowered by the, hallelujah, by the God who lives in you. Come on. And I want you to be willing to be obedient to that. And those of you that this isn't normally your church, it isn't my either, so we're on the same place today. I probably won't be back next week, so it might be different. It's okay. But here's what I do know. We all can finish the race. We fight a fight. We finish the race. And we keep the faith. You see, the reason I took them pictures, put that that Bible picture back up there. 
The reason I took those pictures and laid them on that Bible is this, very simple. I'll show it to you in a minute. Is because the metals are temporary. These are passed down to generations. My children have all got one. They've ran with me in a race. They'll pass them to their kids and their grandkids. Or a tornado may take them. I don't know which. I ain't sure yet. But that word, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And if I fail, Lord, you're my redeemer. And I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to make this simple for you, Life Church. I think God's in this. Prayer team, if you'll go ahead and come and line up on the front of this circle or wherever you line up, I don't know. Just turn around and face this crowd. Life Church and visitors and everybody in this building, I'm going to make it simple for you today. It's not going to be difficult. If you, if, you, if you believe God needs to touch you and you want God to touch you, I want you to find your way into these aisles. Hallelujah. Very quickly, just go ahead and move in. God's here this morning. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. You need to be responding to God right now. God's here. Thank you say, I, I need to run this race, but I, I'm tired. God will give you strength to run. Hallelujah. You need, to, you need to fight a little bit more because the enemy has got you in his grip, and it's hard for you to get out of that. You need to start punching. And some of you, you might think you're punching in the middle of the air. That's okay. Keep punching. Fight strong. Overcome. Defeat the Goliath in your life. As I was driving here this morning, I felt like the Lord said this to me, Pastor Kevin. This church needs to live unfiltered. You don't need a, don't, you need to hear me now. All of us have got a filter. The Holy Spirit's my filter. But you need to quit trying to put a filter on the image of your life when you're around certain groups of people to let them see you. And you need to start letting the filter of the Holy Spirit come into your life and out of your life so that other people will be touched by your life. So I'm going to say that one more time. And I think a lot more of you need to be moving really quick. If you really want God to touch you today, Life Church, get in the aisle, walk down through here. People are going to walk up the aisles. They're going to pray for you. And today we're going to believe that God will touch this church and empower you to do the work of the kingdom. Father, in the next few minutes, change the trajectory of the future of the people in this room. Let them be empowered by your presence, Lord equipped by your Holy Spirit, God, and obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. And nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world. Forever rain. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. And nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever rain. I'm running to your arms. Run into your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever. Rain. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of. reach over and touch the person that's right beside you. Either lay your hand on their shoulder or join hands with them. And can we pray with one another right now? And let's just ask the Lord to touch people that are in this room together today. People that are still in the altar praying, that's fine. We want to continue to pray for them. But let's just ask God to, to help us with what we have heard today and we have received today. This is a powerful word for us, for our church. 
And I thank, I thank Dr. Lamb for sharing it with us. But it, it, there were some things in there that he said that I know God inspired that I hope we receive today for what God has for our future. Let's pray together right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're grateful today for your word that we have received. God, thank you for your servant who has listened closely to you and prepared it and shared it from his heart. God, we're grateful for that today. And I pray that we will fight the good fight, that we will run the race, but we will finish well. And Father, I love the illustration of what he said. Maybe we don't see the footprints, but help us to trust as we take that step. And I pray for every person in this room as we lay the hand, lay our hands on the shoulder of someone beside us. Lord, that we would have the confidence that we too can make this. That we can make it in this journey. Father, though we may face difficulty, though we may have failures in our past, God, that we know our present and our future with you is well because of what you're able to do in our lives. And Father, as we pray for our neighbor right now, I pray through the power of Jesus' name, through your spirit, that we would understand we can make it. We will make it. And that you will help us. And we honor you today for your word. Thank you, God, for the challenge that we have received today. And Lord, we're grateful for all that's going to take place, all that's going to happen as a result of your touch, your spirit, and your help. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, one time, can we just give the Lord praise today? Come on, just thank Him for the Word today in our lives, in our heart. Amen. I want to say thanks to Dr. Lamb. He's still praying with people today. Thankful for him being with us. If you can't tell, passionate about what Jesus has done in his life. And here's one thing that I want to tell you that you need to be reminded of. Everybody's got a story. Everybody has a story. And the thing about it is, you don't know everybody's story when they walk through the doors of this, this house. You don't know why they worship the way they worship. You don't know why they are so excited about what Christ has done in their life. And some of us, we may need to recall our story. We may need to remember what God has brought us out of. Because sometimes we get into church and we get dignified a little bit. Not here, other places. But we need to remember our story of what Jesus has brought us out of. Where Jesus, how he has helped us. How he set us free. And it would do us good to remember how we acted, those that grew up in the church. What we acted like in children's church. We were so excited about Jesus, we didn't care who was around us. Just remember what God has done for you. That's why you got to keep running. That's why you got to finish well. That's why you got to stay committed to the process. And it's going to be amazing to see what God's going to do. I don't know about you today, but I'm glad Life Church Hunts was a church made of a people just like you that understand together we're going to make a difference in the Huntsville community. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Don't forget next Sunday morning I'm going to be preaching a message entitled Unlocking the Unlimited. So if you're going to be here, I know some of you will be gone for Memorial Day. But come on, be with us. We're going to have a great time together. I can't wait to preach that message. And then we start Stretch on June 4th, which is Pentecost Sunday. Don't forget, we're a Pentecostal church. We're spirit-filled. I'll be talking about the Holy Spirit on that day. If you don't understand components of the Holy Spirit, it's a great day for you to be here on June the 4th. But next Sunday, Unlocking the Unlimited. Father, go with us as we leave today. Thank you for our graduates. Thank you for the word that has been shared. Thank you for the atmosphere of your presence that we sense. And God, we believe together great things are in store for this church. We're going to walk with you. We know that you're even going before us now. And Father, I pray today, keep us as we go. Bless all those who are graduating, who have graduated and who are graduating this week. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.